The riff to the new generation, the, the one that I'm playing with the scratch thing, the whoosh, whoosh, that thing. That's just like, you know, what I call a sound check riff, pretty much. It's something, and, and so many songs are born like that. We recorded the whole thing and mixed it, and just something missing at the intro and couldn't figure it out. Well, Scotty had been playing a riff for years in rehearsal. Like literally, I don't know. I've heard this riff had to be like five years old, I think. And he kept, he kept playing in a different key and it would always stick in the back of my head. I'm like, I gotta write a song around that. I gotta write a song around. So one day we went up into the studio and we're listening to New Generation and we're like, the song is cool. We're really into this song. It just needs something. And I just go, Scotty. The riff, the riff, and he starts playing the riff, and he changes the key, and it worked out perfect. And that's the crazy riff in the beginning of New Generation in the intro. Scotty and Rachel and myself kind of collectively realized we've started Skid Row, and there's a legacy to uphold. This is stuff means way too much to us just to let it go and let it let it just dissolve into nothing. He brought it up to me and said he had spoke to Rachel about it, and it was, I was like, yeah, man, sounds great, but, you know, we gotta do things differently this time. Just got an email. It was, very, it was really weird. It's like, uh, you know, think of, thinking about putting the band back together, I uh, wanted to know if you wanted to audition, you know, Rachel Bowen. It was that, it was that simple, that, that short. Halfway through the first song really was the, at the point that we knew he was the guy. He had a great voice, great attitude. I mean, it's one of those things, we thought it was going to take a really long time to find a singer, and it was just, it just, Fell, in, fell into our laps almost by chance. We always had an idea of what we wanted it to sound like, and it was never really what we wanted it to sound like. When Johnny did it, it sounded exactly like what we were thinking. And I just remember looking over at Snake, like kind of looking down at the ground so Johnny couldn't see me and look at Snake, and Snake is like going, oh, yeah. Such a great memory of you know when Johnny came down to audition and, and how confident he was and, and just really he was quiet but he was really confident and he just went in there and, and a room full of strangers in a strange house in a strange town um, right off the plane from Texas you know and just started we started drinking a little Jack Daniels and started you know jamming and he just blew us away and we knew by the middle of the second song that he was the guy. He got really drunk the first night and uh, fell down the stairs at Snake's house. And the stairs were lined with, you know, gold and platinum records and all this. Took all the records with him, screwed up his ankle. He was limping around for weeks. And, uh, you know, so that was, that was our first impression of Johnny. We had known Phil for so long that he was just natural. It felt like Phil should have been in the band a long time ago. And now that he's in the band, I think we're all wondering why we asked him to join. <laughs> uh, he's by far the funniest human being I've ever met in my life.
boyfriend with a man in a diaper. <laughs> <laughs> Phil, I know you're on the Springer show. <laughs> I'm the man in the cotton diaper. Four out of five of us living in, at Snakes, and uh, you would rehearse by rehearse by uh, nighttime and try and keep yourself busy during the day. There's a whole lot of drinking going on, a whole lot of getting to know each other, and uh, it's probably the basis uh, that supplied the base for the band to get along so well and be able to work together so well. Because, man, we were there. It was three meals a day together, riding together, rehearsing together, getting ready to tour together. You know, what are you gonna wear? Your hair looks like shit. You know, you're getting fat. You know, you know, all that shit happening. Safety pin on his bib. I like a diaper wearing <laughs> man. Diaper wearing man. The camaraderie that we built at my house and in that studio was really laid the groundwork for, you know, the, the coming years of, of the band. I'm getting it now. You want rat, rat shit, shit, bat shit, dirty right. old twat. <laughs> <laughs> Finger in a nut. <laughs> oh, shit. Oh, bacon. <laughs> in the kitchen, it was the funniest thing. You got, you know, four guys that think they can cook in there. You got bread from Oh, yeah. Get some bread oh. If not, there's got to be some old crusty oh, stuff. Yeah. There's bread around. Well, right. see the cloud. You make bread crumbs, you just crumble the bread in the pan. Crusty. Oh, Season it. it. You got it? Oh, yeah. I watch way too much uh, food TV. This is how we learn to cook. If I was in a hurry, maybe, yes. Yeah, not so bad. Not as good as this, but not so bad. No, no, definitely not as good as this. Okay, so what happens next? I'm just going to scrape this down a bit. We can finish it with a spatula. That's bacon. Boom. Bakes. I saw a good recipe on Emerald the other night, though. Something nice and easy. He makes cool shit. Like salmon deal. I saw this guy uh, making shit last night. And then he started cutting up this stuff. I was like, what the fuck is that? It's tripe. You ever eat tripe? No. That's like cow stomach lining or something. It's disgusting. Ugh. There's like three things I will not even try to eat. That's tripe, snails, and frog's legs. Yeah, those guys were living in that house too long. I'd come over and they'd say, you know, we'd say, ah, we're gonna start rehearsing at two today, and I'd get there at two. Where's everybody? Yo! Let's play. Hey. 
Johnny would still be in bed, Snake would be having coffee, or maybe out at Home Depot or something. Nobody would be there. Those are nice shorts. Where'd you get them, Cisco? Oh, Dude, I, huh? I, I Yeah, right here. This is where I got them. <laughs> where the hell's that plug at? <laughs> Somewhere. Put you around. I knew he would find a way to get his That's ass on film. scary thing. I would surface for, you know, out of, out of the cave if there was something going on. Like rehearsal, you know. But I would wait. I would stay in bed until I hear the footsteps, because that's another thing, too. Like, you could hear activity, so I could actually hear Scott come in. And then I'd get out of bed. But up until then, I was like, everyone's going to be late. I just had a riff that I, I came up with in the car and came up with some music and then as Snake and I always do, we just kind of throw our ideas together and just stir it all up, you know, like some evil stew. Thick, Thick as the Skin was written on the KISS tour and it was basically Snake and Rachel just got into a room together and had riffs and banged it off each other. That was the first song that was written uh, for the new record. Now we got an idea for a chorus, musically. It's just... Um, Snake and I have been songwriting partners for a long time, and we both are very passionate about what we think is right. We kind of know what's going to work out better for the song, but sometimes you hit an impasse, and you know maybe Snake likes this part, maybe I don't like it so much. So the yeah, tension builds, and sometimes you can cut it with a, you need a machete to cut it. I'm kind of lost when you say there's too many parts, only because it's like a verse. B verse it's and just chorus. Busy parts, it seems like to me. I don't know what it seems like to you guys, but the parts, the other parts, it just seems very busy. I mean, it's extremely busy. You got the picking, the uh, right, the heavy B. I mean, to me, it's no more busy than monkey business. Matter of fact, that part doesn't bother me. I think it's all right. All right, whatever. It just seems really busy to me. And then adding that bridge part, it's just. Oh, I always just I. I mean, again, I'm not, I'm not married to that at all. Right. It, if we use it great, if not, that's fine. I, I, I just think that heavy part kind of kills the groove going into that, but whatever. Basically, the way we've been working since I got the studio down here is, and uh, everyone's here, is that we kind of, Rachel, myself, or, or actually the, all of us will sit down and, and we'll finish the skeleton of a song and then we'll bring it down into the rehearsal area and uh, just start jamming on it when everyone feels really comfortable with it and feels like they've, you know, come up with their parts and all that stuff, so on and so forth. <laughs> With us four living there and us four rehearsing basically every day, it was just incredibly nuts. Incredibly nuts. And then about halfway through it or three quarters of the way through it, I decided that I was going to get sober. And it was the biggest mistake. I had to live in my room basically because those guys 
had tequila bottles all over the place. Phil's dragging, like at one point, we dragged two garbage cans full of about 185 beers or something like that up to the top. And that's not including like the bottles of whiskey and bottles of rum and bottles of absolute whatever. And it was just, it was mayhem. And we were, I, it's amazing that we survived because the house was, you know, when I went to put my house on the market, I had to have people come in like for two, three weeks just to clean up. It was brutal. It was absolutely brutal. The place was such a wreck. Snake's moving out. Moving out of his house. How long you been here? 11 years? 12 years. This is his suitcase. Snake and I are driving to Atlanta this afternoon. I have the feeling this will be the last time he sees his house. Am I right? Yes. More about that later. We're down in the studio. Snake's house. This is where many a Skid Row tune goes on Monday and lots of other songs were done down here. Demos. I think a few records were done down here too. Hey Snake, where are we going? Away from this fucking place. Say goodbye. Snake's house. Sold. Sold. Well, I had to sell it because I had to get rid of everybody. I had. I was like, I can't live like this anymore. This is nuts. And we're gonna all kill ourselves, you know. Everything's changed. All ties are strange, say the least. Concepts deranged. It's just the. I remember Tom Hamilton from Aerosmith telling me that that's how they recorded most of their first records. While they were on tour, they put out records in six month intervals back in the 70s. And he goes, that's you know, pretty much how we did it. I was thinking, man, that would be just so crazy to do it like that. Now here we are doing it. And it is crazy, it's just it's very nerve wracking. I hate the studio. I hate it. I hate, I, I love recording and, and listening to the product, like it's because it's like I'm proud of what we did. I just hate the studio. It was kind of cool, actually. I mean, recording at John Jovi's house was totally badass, of course. You know, Pico is one of the greatest drummers, rock drummers there, there, there is. And just a, a chance to rummage through his shit was fucking great. <laughs> I just hope he doesn't get pissed off when he sees it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going through Tico Torres' <laughs> snare collection right now. Don't tell Tico. Are there drummer stuff? Tico's crazy snare collection. I think this one will be the one we're looking for. Never know. Ever, ever know. <laughs> All set? Yeah! Come on, Bobber. <laughs> That's all I got.
Yeah, but it might be on. It's on. Yeah. Let's just hear the take. You like that take? Let me just hear it. Maybe I can overdub a bump, 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 bump. What the fuck are you talking about? I have a clue. He did something different, but it sounded awesome. It was just rocking out. As Rachel sleeps, so Whatever sleeps Rachel. I remember Rachel and I were, again, we were down in Texas, and we really, really wanted to do something that was just, you know, that people would close their eyes and, and just float, you know? And, but we wanted it to be something positive, you know, about new beginnings. And I liked it because I got a chance to really croon a little bit, man, and, you know, and a lot of people can get in there and, and have gang choruses, and you know, a lot of bands out there do that. Skid Row's done that in the past. I wanted something a little more um, where I could like, you know, sing a little bit for you, you <laughs> know, show the skills. And uh, plus it was shortly after 9-11 uh, that that was written and it just had, you know, everybody was in a kind of a, that kind of mood. And it, it, one light, you know, one light burns, one light fades. Uh, it had a great feel to it. I loved it. I loved singing it. There's a sound in my head, holy wine. Between time and what we said Drifts the innocence we've shared In this moment there's a day For a sad and broken babe There's a fracture on this hollow ground One light burns and one light fades behind the door of better days. It's just, you know, it's metaphors, but it's basically saying, you know, what lies ahead is, is what matters, you know, and it's all good. One light burns and one light fades behind the door of better days when the light shines on me. I'll know the world still turns One light burns
started out uh, at John Bon Jovi studio in New Jersey, which is a gorgeous place, really super nice. We cut most of the drum tracks there. Actually, we cut the whole record there pretty much, and then we went back later and scrapped a bunch of it and started over. And the majority of the record was recorded at uh, Shorefire in New Jersey, in Long Branch, New Jersey. And the guy that owns the place, Joey DeMeo, is a good friend of ours, and we really work well together. And that studio has got the magic. Every time we go in there, man, something great happens, musically. I'm a big fan of like old Fender guitars and amps and things like that. And in this band, it's, it doesn't really call for those sounds, but I try and find places to put them in. And a good example would be uh, the lead in I Remember You. We took the guitar and the amp that they used originally for those sounds and put a mic in front of them and, and uh, started fooling around with that. So there you have that. Because, you know, everybody always says to me, man, that lead in I Remember You, the original version. They're like, man, that's such a cool lead. I'm like, yeah, but you know, now this is a different type of tune, so what, what angle am I gonna take? And the whole song's in a completely opposite direction, but so I just said, man, we're just put this, the twangy surf guitar all over this. I swear you never been alone. there's a new technology or a new toy, man, I'll run right out to Best Buy and, and grab it. Hi, is Phil. That yours? Yes, it is. Oh, another toy. Another toy. I'm the toy boy. Hi. I'm the toy boy. Hi, this is Phil. Kind of shy. Kind of shy. You'll be seeing a lot of this guy. Hey, look at it. Snake in his underpants. Snake's... I, up for you. <laughs> I saw your pee-pee. Snake, uh... Snake sleeps in his socks and his underpants. Yeah, his underpants. Sleep in his fucking place. Body bag. You, uh, yeah, man. I, I took off my comforter and there was like 90,000 cum stains on the fucking blanket. I had your oh. room before you. We did? Oh, man. Okay. And, uh... I feel the things I said But never said how I felt that is one of the first songs that um, that Johnny had to sink into on an emotional level, you know. Not so much like a, that's a song that was anger driven or anything like that, but you know, sort of a of loss and moving on and sort of coming to terms with the things that you may or may not have done that, that may not be always the best uh, at the particular time in your life, but you know. There was certainly no malintent and, and just trying to get that across, kind of a way of saying, look, I'm, I'm sorry. Long ago, when forever was our friend, but now freedom's what I feel inside. It hurts so much to let you go, to know we'll never touch again. Those songs make so many changes. They're not the same from the time they're written to the time they're recorded. So you got some time in there to fix what you don't like or, or, or intensify a part. Ghost was recorded for the record and we wanted to make some changes to it so we just completely re-recorded it. 
And one of the things we did was we cut the lead in half because it was too long. After the KISS tour, I mean, that lasted, it was only originally supposed to be a four-month tour, and it lasted almost nine months. I'm a drunk guitar player in a fucking kick-ass rock band, motherfucker. <laughs> you own this place, motherfucker! Uh, we went out and did some of our own stuff, and then immediately just started writing, writing, writing. And then we went back out on tour, and we were still writing and demoing. And I mean, the, the album's been kind of two years in the making. What about Psycho Love? We could put Get the Fuck Out After I Remember You version 02. Okay. And then just switch those around. Lucky what I see, it's beer. Mm, beer. Looking at me. Beer. beer. Looking at me. We got it. Beer. One, two. Have we got all of them on there? You all six of them on these here? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Why, are you going to join me? That's a good yeah. deal, man. I don't really want to wait ten minutes, but I will. See you. Anything. Hi. Don't mess with my orange juice. That's yours? What's cooking? Getting a burn. What are you doing with man? Oh, that's where he hides the good stuff. Thank you, Chicago. That's my town. I'm going back to get in the brown hole. 420, a beer tastes good. Nice guy, T. I'm not here, man. I'm not here. That tastes damn good. still the winter passes by. these parts in these songs that you know rather than doing the typical typical guitar solo where the guy drops to his knees in the middle of the stage and everybody's gone and all that stuff you know it works for Ace Frehley but not for us so uh, we'll just take a, a little section of song extend it and uh, do your thing in there you know? and I, I love doing that part um, in monkey business it's a lot of fun it gives me a chance to just play whatever the hell I feel like it for as long as I feel like playing. It's usually not that long. You know, I just make, make my point and get out.
never ever had an argument. We've always come to terms really, really quick on who should play the solo. Most of the time, for me, it seems like the song does dictate who should play it. If I like to play a lead, you could maybe whistle or you know something that would stick in your head. And Snake plays the uh, the really fast and crazy guitar hero type of thing. I started playing bass was because of Gene Simmons and I showed my parents a picture of Gene Simmons and he had blood all over him and things were on fire. I go, I want to play what he plays and without even batting an eye they go, what does he play? <laughs> you know, they didn't say no, no, you know. And uh, uh, so I got a bass for Christmas that year and, and just played it from there and when I was a kid I was like, man, someday I'm going to meet Gene Simmons and all this stuff and then sure as shit I did, you know, and I, at first meeting with Gene I just said, you know, I go, I know you hear this all the time, but I got to tell you, you're the reason I started playing bass. And it was kind of like, what's the reaction going to be? Because you're always scared to meet your influences, you know? And he goes, someday, I, uh, someday some kid starting out will tell you the same thing. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. You know, it was 89, we were on our first tour. And, you know, we, we were playing and a and, uh, guy comes up to me and he goes, I play Spectre basses because of you. And I was like, cool. He's like, man, you're my biggest influence. I play bass because you play. And all of a sudden I just remember that picture of Gene telling me in the dressing room in L.A. Somebody will tell you the same thing one day. And Rachel has been the biggest influence on me. Got me started playing bass. Playing Spectre's yeah, choice man. of basses. And I mean, finally getting to hang with the man. Sweet. Hey, can you, you leave me? You gotta go now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks, Phil. <Bill. laughs>
Okay, so here's the situation. Rachel Shat in a bag. He's trying to find a place to get rid of it. If we're parked behind the Oh, fucking... dude, God, I swear I can't. <laughs> if we're parked behind the fucking place. No morality. That'd be great, but the fans are right out there. If you got a, another bag to put that in, you can walk off the bus like an English lunch or something. <laughs> <laughs> it was yesterday's lunch. How do, you zoom, yes, how do you zoom in, Scotty? Huh? How do you zoom in? Uh, uh, with your with your, with your index finger up on the I side, top, it. towards the front. Don't they have any fucking garbage cans? Oh, they're fascist. So they need what's on top. Oh, no, shit, there's a trench. Yeah, it's been too far. It's the hang out of the trench. God damn! Woo! Oh, yeah, it's starting to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 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 the dilemma. Where to dispose of my excrement? Is there a vent? Oh god, get it off the bus! <laughs> it's so bad right now. <laughs> no way! <laughs> Go, man. <laughs> oh yeah, it smells like a bad baby. <laughs> Gita, and you can't drive into New York City by yourself between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 a.m. <laughs> so how'd that work? Did you pick up somebody? You had to pick up a homeless guy. There's homeless guys standing outside the tunnel Are making extra cash. In New York? That's the first time in a long, long time that I've actually been in a car when it's still been dark out before the sun came up. And sober. <laughs> and sober yes. after, you know, after going to sleep. That's fucking nuts. crazy. That's nuts. So I was, I drove in at, uh, I was up at 5.30 this morning. Were you going duck hunting? It was in my car at <laughs> quarter to seven. It would be in scrap iron. Scrappy. Scrappy. Um, and then I'm on the, I go through exit 16E, give my money in and everything, and then all of a sudden I see the sign. We come up with some pretty creative ways to beat the boredom and to keep ourselves busy during any kind of downtime, whether it's off the road or the studio. And that's when it gets me the most, is when I'm in the studio doing absolutely nothing. We'll roll dice, we'll drive race cars, whatever it takes, you know, just so that we don't lose our minds. Hold on. <laughs> Diving school. Nice. <laughs> look at the hair, look at the hair, look at the hair. How's my hair? Don't touch. This is the family that you have to trust, that you, you know, that you trust with everything, you know. 
Um, and that's exactly what it is. This is the rock and roll as we see it now. And, uh, you know, it, it fits. There's not a lot of good rock and roll out there, man. There's just not. I think that uh, <laughs> a nice mixture of a dirty rock and roll band that, that'll, that'll stay at Motel 6 and doesn't take themselves too seriously. They're here for the fans, they're here for the beer, they're here for the party. And there's not enough of that in this country. Rock and roll is a beautiful thing. It needs to be explored. It doesn't need to be downplayed. It doesn't need to be wrapped over. It needs to come back to the forefront, man. It, it used to rule the country, and it will again.